different theme for each one of the, the lessons. And last week I had uh, Jesus, a man of action. And this time I've chosen the, the theme of Jesus, a man of power. Uh, our, the part we're going to cover tonight are the scriptures that I've got on the screen there, uh, Mark chapter 5 uh, through Mark chapter 7. And um, that roughly corresponds with the readings that we've been, uh, that we've been doing each day. And so hopefully uh, you've been able to do at least the reading and kind of keep up with the stuff that we've been talking about. The first section I want to talk about is how Jesus demonstrated his power over a variety of different things. He uh, demonstrated his power over nature, uh, his power over demons, his power over disease. Um, and this actually kind of goes back to the, um, the picking up what we ended up on last week. And that's back in Mark chapter 3. And the very end of Mark chapter 3, and starting in, um, I'm sorry, yeah, Mark, into Mark chapter 4, excuse me. Mark chapter 4, beginning in verse 35. And that's where uh, Jesus had told his disciples to go uh, to the other side of the sea as he dismissed the crowd. And then as they were traveling back by boat across the Sea of Galilee, a, a terrible storm came up um, and it frightened the apostles. Now, remember, most of them were experienced fishermen. Uh, they were used to the Sea of Galilee. They were nor, you know, accustomed to storms like this, but this is one that was so violent um, that they had thought that they were going to die. And yet they found that Jesus was asleep you know, on a cushion in the, uh, in the, uh, the keel of the boat or the end of the, excuse me, the start of the boat. And so they came back to him and woke him up and asked him, don't you even care that we're about to die? And that's where Jesus uh, just kind of sat up uh, from his sleep and, and told the sea to be still. And immediately the storm stopped, not a general, you know, call me of the storm as the storm might pass. We've seen storms like that, you know, they'll be raging and powerful. And then over a short period of time, five or 10 minutes, as the storm cloud passes over, the, the storm calms down. This happened instantly. Um, and then Jesus talked about why they were so afraid of that and how that he didn't want them to have that kind of fear. Uh, and then they became afraid of him. And as I said, who is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? Uh, and then we get into the reading that we actually started doing this week. And that was uh, what we find in chapter five. When they got to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, this is where we find the, uh, the man who had unclean spirit, as it turns out, a, a, a multitude of unclean spirits that were uh, possessing him. It's described the fact that he could not be bound with chains. Uh, this shows the superhuman strength that uh, these demons gave this man. As I thought about that, I thought about it, it's not just uh, someone, you know, having adrenaline running through them and being able to, uh, to do something, you know, amazing and incredible. This is beyond the capability of the human body. Uh, you know, bones would break before chains would break. Uh, and yet this man was able to break chains and break the shackles that they tried to put on him. He was completely out of the control of man. Just like the storm had been completely out of control, this man possessed by demons was completely out of control. Nobody could, nobody could control him. Uh, and yet we find where Jesus did. Uh, Jesus cast these demons out. And, and I found that very interesting, the contrast, how that Jesus in previous occasions, and we're going to see again later, where when someone uh, is healed by him or you know, in, in some way or another, Jesus has demonstrated his power, and they talk about uh, the miracles that he performed, or he's the son of God, uh, that Jesus forbids them from speaking. And we find the same thing here, that here the demons come to Jesus, that they, they said they saw Jesus coming from a distance in verse 6. This man would have witnessed the same storm. Uh, the Sea of Galilee is not that large. A storm of this power you know, anybody around the Sea of Galilee would have been able to see it, probably experienced it. And then the storm instantly stops. Uh, and then Jesus and his disciples come on shore. This man would have seen all of that. In fact, we can tell from the account 
that there was a cliff nearby. He, maybe he was even up on top of this cliff. And yet he comes rushing to Jesus as soon as the boat comes to the shore. And as soon as he gets out and he cries out, what have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? And he begs, please don't torment me. I found that very fascinating because what have the demons been doing to this man? Well, they have been tormenting him. And yet the demons are asking Jesus, don't torment me. Uh, obviously, there's an inconsistency there. there. There's hypocrisy there. There's something else we'll notice in our class tonight. Uh, they don't want to be tormented, and yet they have been tormenting all along. Um, the other thing I found interesting is what is it that torments demons? And it appears to be what is torment to, to demons is not having a body to possess. Uh, they don't want to be into the abyss. They don't want to be in a situation where they're not possessing somebody. And so that's where they beg uh, for the swine, the herd of swine, uh, let us possess these swine. Um, and Jesus, again, kind of surprising to me, uh, agrees to their request. Uh, he allows them to possess the herd of swine uh, instead of being cast out into the abyss. Now, when we read in the book of Revelation, and we find the, the, the great story of Jesus fighting against the dragon and the two beasts and all of those servants, uh, what is it that we're told? That they are thrown into the abyss. Um, and, and so, although Jesus here... Uh, gives into the request of these particular demons, uh, it is not an eternal. Uh, you know, eternally, they're not going to be able to escape the abyss. Um, and so we find that Jesus gave them permission there in verse 13. They drowned the herd of swine. This also tells us that this region was a Gentile-dominated uh, region. Uh, Almost certainly these swine were actually being raised by Gentiles. The servants that were taking care of them would have been working for Gentiles. Uh, there's no indication that this man himself was a Gentile. Uh, there's two occasions we know of where Jesus specifically involves uh, a Gentile and healing or uh, some nature, and, and there's nothing in this context to suggest that. Uh, so we would assume this man was a Jew, but it is a Gentile uh, area. The Decapolis that we read about where the man went and proclaimed this message after it's over, that's a Greek name. It, it literally means 10 cities. And it was 10 Greek cities that had been founded by Alexander the Great and, and his successors uh, that dwelt in this region of the Jews. But this is where um, a number of Gentiles would have lived. I guess maybe the part that fascinated me most about this whole story is when the people of the city came because of the handlers of the swine had gone into the cities and told them what had happened and they came out to see it, that when the people came and saw this man sitting there, properly dressed, in his right mind, acting like a normal human being, that it said they became frightened by that. I, I found that so fascinating they were more frightened by him acting normally than they were by the way that he was acting before when he was breaking chains and breaking shackles and could not be controlled by any man. Uh, and it's very similar to the story that we read there at the end of chapter four. The disciples were frightened by the storm in the sea, but then when Jesus showed power over that, they became even more frightened. And here we find where Jesus has shown this power over demons, demons they couldn't control. And yet now that Jesus has demonstrated his power over that, they are more frightened than they were before. And then when we look in the last part of chapter four, we find where Jesus shows his power over various diseases. Now, there's two stories here that are intertwined together. Uh, the first one of them is a man named Jairus. One of the few times where we find one of these uh, auxiliary characters that's actually given a name. Uh, this man that we just saw that had the, the demons, we know what the name of the demons were, but we don't know what his name was. Many occasions, Peter's mother-in-law, for example, we don't know what her name was. 
Uh, the woman that we're going to talk about in the middle of the story who had the hemorrhage for 12 years, we don't know her name, but we are told the name of Jairus. And I think the reason why we're told the name of Jairus is because of his position. Mark tells us that he is a synagogue official. Now, we don't know which synagogue, which city we're talking about. It's one of the cities of Galilee, but we don't know which one. But we find that Jairus was a synagogue official. Would he have been among the synagogue officials that we know that have already opposed Jesus? If you go back to chapter 3, at the beginning of chapter 3, remember on the Sabbath day, there was a man with a withered hand, and the synagogue officials were watching Jesus carefully to see if he was going to heal them on the Sabbath because they wanted to find a case to accuse him. And this is where Jesus asked the question first, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath day? And they wouldn't answer him. And Jesus became angry over the fact that they would deny healing to this man in keeping with their uh, misapplication of the, of the laws of the Sabbath. Well, here we find this man Jairus is identified by name. And I just wonder if that's Mark's point is to identify him for the people he wrote to in his time period, would they have known this man by his name? But if he had been among those who had opposed Jesus, he's got a very different attitude now. And of course, the reason why he has a different attitude now is his daughter is very sick. In fact, he says his daughter is at the point of death there in verse 23. And he comes to Jesus and says, you come and lay your hands on her that she will get well and live. Again, we don't want to assume for certain that he had been one that had opposed Jesus. But now when it's involving his family, those that he's closest to, there's only one place he turns to. He turns to Jesus. He knows that Jesus is the one who can do something about that. That tells us the miracles that Jesus has already performed what effect that had on the people. It tells us what they really knew from what they see. Even the ones who opposed him could not deny the power of what Jesus was doing. And so he came to Jesus and asked, please come and lay your hands on my daughter so that she may be healed. As they're on the way there, we find there's a crowd of people, you know, just surrounding Jesus as he walked. I imagine scenes that maybe we've seen on television of uh, celebrities, you know, trying to go through a crowd of people or sports figures or politicians or anybody that, is, you know, has drawn a lot of acclaim from people. There are crowds of people want to touch them, want to be around them, want to shake their hand or fist pump or whatever, you know, just they want to have some sort of contact. And, and we see the crowd of people surrounding Jesus. And this woman is in the crowd and notice what it says in verse 28. She was just thinking, if I can just touch his clothing, uh, then I will be well. And so somehow she was able to get in close enough to Jesus that she could just reach out and touch his clothing. And she was right. As soon as she touched his clothing, she was instantly healed. Mark tells us that doctors had been trying to heal her for 12 years. One of the other gospel accounts, uh, or actually Mark even says that she spent everything she had and nobody had been able to heal her. But now when she touches Jesus, she's healed. So we see the power that Jesus has over nature. We see the power he has over the demons. We see the power that he has over disease. And every time it shocks the people, it scares the people, it frightens the people. Um, here we find when Jesus felt this power going out of him, that he turned around and asked the crowd, who touched me? The disciples were kind of thinking, what a ridiculous question in this crowd of people. Everybody's touching you. Uh, you know, what, why do you try to single out one person? But this woman heard that question and notice it says in verse 33, she feared and was trembling and came before Jesus and fell down before him. This woman was fearful. Now she's been healed, the very thing she was looking for, but yet when she recognizes that Jesus knows what happened, she's very fearful. 
And Jesus tells her, be called. Your faith is what you healed you. There is a connection between faith and fear, or maybe we should say a disconnection or reverse connection, if you would, between faith and fear. What was it Jesus had said to his disciples there when they were frightened by the storm? Why are you so timid? Why do you have no faith? Here we find the demonstration of this woman's faith and how that it healed her. Well, while Jesus is talking to this woman, someone else comes up and they come up from the house of the synagogue official and they tell him it's too late. Don't trouble the teacher anymore. Your daughter has died. And that's where Jesus said, don't be afraid any longer. Again, you see the connection. Faith and fear are really the polar opposites of one another. The man had enough faith to come and ask Jesus to come lay hands on her and she would be healed. He knew that if Jesus touched her, she would be healed. But now she's dead. And he doesn't believe that, she, that Jesus can bring her back. Jesus says, don't be fearful anymore, but only believe. And so now he goes to the house, but notice now there's not going to be a crowd. In fact, Jesus even won't take all of his apostles. Only the three, Peter, James, and John. I think this is the first time that Mark has separated these three apostles out. So these three apostles go with Jesus to the house of the officials. There's a crowd of people inside. This was standard among the, the Hebrews that there would be uh, the, 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 the wailers, if you would, uh, when someone had died. And so there's a crowd of people that were giving their lament, uh, and Jesus kind of asked them, why are you all making this commotion? Why are you all weeping like this? And he tells them the child is not dead, but just asleep. Uh, it reminds me very much of when the angels came to Abraham and said uh, that you will have a child, uh, and your wife, who is uh, almost 90 years old, will have a child at this time next year. And we're told that both Abraham and Sarah on separate occasions, but on, both of them laughed at this idea. Here we find where Jesus said, this girl is not, is not dead, she's just asleep. The, the people laughed at this idea. It's, it's not a laughter like telling a good joke. It's laughter like, no, I don't believe that could be true. Uh, but he sends everyone out uh, and has only the three apostles and the parents of the girl. He goes into the girl and simply tells her to get up. And this 12-year-old girl immediately got up and began to walk. Just like when he had healed Peter's mother-in-law of the fever, it wasn't a slow progression to health, but it was instant. Um, and then Jesus said, feed her, she's hungry. Uh, wanted to make sure they understood. Everything is normal. Everything is like she's perfectly healthy. And so we find that Jesus here has demonstrated his power in a variety of different ways. Let's uh, stop at that moment and see if anybody's got any uh, questions or comments. I've got something, I've got a couple things actually, if that's okay. Yes, please. Um, this, the, the first thing you were talking about with the, the man who recognized, recognizes Jesus and uh, has the legion of demons makes me think of uh, Matthew 12 verse 45 where uh, it's talking about a, a demon can leave and then come back with several more even more powerful than it and I wonder if if that's how this progressed for this man if he had one or two and then had several and and that eventually led to legion or if he uh, to a legion of them or if he truly had uh, a, a legion to begin with um, but that's the kind of speculation, you know, that's, that's not particularly helpful, but I just thought I'd mention that passage in Matthew. Um, oh, I appreciate it. I, I, I don't have an answer to it, but I, I appreciate you, uh, making that connection. I do think it's an interesting connection to make. Um, I have a question for you, Eddie, about the, you mentioned if a, a body's being important to the demons, uh, why do you think after getting cast into the uh, into the pigs that they then drown themselves. Do you think they still resided in the body of the dead hogs or do you, or dead pigs, or how do you think that went? Or if you had to speculate? Uh, it's a good question. And unfortunately, I don't have an answer. Um, I think the demons are like uh, 
Satan and his angels and really like us. I think their spirits are are eternal, um, eternally dying, eternally suffering, uh, but nonetheless eternal. Um, so I don't think they were destroyed uh, by the swine uh, going into the water. Um, but whether they continue to possess those bodies, that that that's a good question. Unfortunately, I don't I don't have any kind of an answer for. Yeah, I just thought I'd ask. Um, I appreciate it. Thank you. One more comment and then I'll leave it. Oh, and then I'll stop and let okay. anybody else. But uh, I thought it was interesting reading this uh, where the crowd is just completely amassing around Christ to the point that there, uh, that there are people touching him all over. And mm -hmm. this woman is trying to get through a, a throng of people to get to touch him. And so there's this overwhelming view of people who are clamoring for Jesus and believe in him. And then immediately we, tr we transfer to this house of the synagogue leader who, you know, these people hear him say, Oh, she's not dead. And, and they kind of ridicule him. So we go from, uh, you know, they're, they're laughing, you know, we don't believe that. Uh, so we go from this incredible crowd of people who believe to this small group of people who don't mm -hmm. uh, within a very small passage. And I just think that contrast is interesting. I, I agree with you. Absolutely. Very good pickup. Yeah. That's the one, honestly I'd miss, but I'm, I'm glad you bring that up because that is a, a fantastic contrast to show how that when we talk about multitudes, it never means everybody. The, it, though the multitudes who turn against him, there was always exceptions of those who did not bow the knee to, to bail. And then the multitudes that were with him, there was always someone who was plotting against him. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, it looks like, Nate, you had a, a comment I saw, and maybe somebody else. Um, I just thought um, it was interesting to look at how Mark uses the same um, word you've talked about him using immediately a lot, but in this passage here, how the demon says, at least in the uh, New American Standard, um, I implore you by God, implore him earnestly, implored him, again, those are in verses 7 mm -hmm. and in 12. You know, the demons are imploring him to, to not, um, um, you know, punish him or, or punish them, sorry. Um, and then down in 17, after this has happened, the people begin to then mm -hmm. implore Jesus to leave. And I was trying to look at the, at the Greek of that. The, uh, at least 10, 12, and 17 all have the same um, root word there on, uh, on that implore. And just trying to think about how, like, just, just trying to see things for what they really were, you know, the, the people weren't sort of seeing right. All that they could see was like the loss of all of their, uh, of their goods that went down <laughs> into the ravine. And uh, they weren't trying to see Jesus for what he really was, um, which I mean, could also apply to our daily lives of just like, what are we really trying to perceive and where can we be better uh, ready to see Jesus be working? Right. Yeah. I appreciate that. Very good connection there with the, with that term because it's not used very commonly, but it is in that particular passage. We find that over and over again. Um, and an interesting connection between the demons and the people that lived there. They were clearly very worldly and materialistic. Uh, uh, they, they both are using the same kind of language uh, in how they talk to Jesus. Anybody else? We got some really good comments so far. Anybody else with thoughts or ideas that you wanted to uh, to talk about I, this particular I had, section? I had a uh, thought about the uh, the woman who had the issue of blood. She would have been ceremonially or unclean by the law of Moses, mm -hmm. and uh, from that perspective, anything she touched would have become unclean. But Jesus, with the power of God, as soon as she touches him, the power goes from him to make her clean. And so 
God makes things clean. And when we touch unclean things, we become unclean. So it's a big contrast there. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, we got some fantastic thoughts uh, going on this evening. Anybody else with uh, anything that you noticed in this section? The, All right, uh, was, oh, go ahead. Somebody else had a comment. Oh, uh, it's, it's Matt. Um, the, uh, yeah. the men who are herding the pigs, they then run into town and tell the story and then come back out to see the, the man who had the legion of demons. And their immediate reaction is, you know, Jesus, can you leave? And then they do, or, you know, Christ does uh, listen to them and their, their request. But um, the, the man who was possessed then says, well, let me come with you. And he says, no, I, I actually want you to stay. And he um, not only preaches in the, the city that he's from, but he then goes even further east to, um, oh, I cannot remember the name of the city. But um, Decapolis, it, it yeah. actually means ten cities, and so he goes to a particular region. Mm -hmm. Decapolis, even preaching all, you know, the spreading this word. So even though Christ really wasn't welcome into the city, the word about Christ continued to be preached because of the work that he'd done with this one person, one of the probably one of the most uh, disadvantaged people in the entire city. Now restored and given a new lease on life now gets to go preach the good word. Yes, exactly. And that in itself is an interesting contrast because in previous occasions where Jesus had, uh, had healed somebody um, and they wanted to talk about it, it said that Jesus gave them specific instructions not to tell anybody. Uh, but in this case, Jesus gives just the very opposite of that. I want you to go and tell this, this message. Um, and I guess the one difference that I noticed is the fact that this is a Gentile dominated region. Whereas in other places where Jesus had told them not to talk about it, it was, you know, these were Jewish communities. Uh, but this is a, uh, a region that is populated with primarily Gentile cities. Uh, yeah. To, to figure out why Jesus did that here and not there, I don't know, but that's the, that's the one distinction between these two regions. Um, anybody else with any thoughts or, or comments in down through uh, the end of chapter five? Jesus is willpower or, you know, I don't know if he had to have willpower in this scenario or if it, he just is the way he is. So that's good enough, I guess. Mm -hmm. But he has total power to do whatever he wants to these demons mm -hmm. whenever he wants. And he doesn't, I mean, he does exactly what he wants to do, but at the same time, it's not what, let's say, Dan would want to do to the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. And I find it interesting that, that Jesus being a, a, the Messiah and always knowing his time and escaping different scenarios because it wasn't yet his time to die. You know, he still knows that if he continues to, to feed little pieces of who he is out at a time maybe it's easier to accept i don't know but you know it's not yet his time to really blow the roof off this thing and you see the chatter the the word is spreading about this messiah and it builds and builds and builds and you know the the defeating of death is coming and jesus knows that's not just yet lets the demons into the pigs, he's still in control of everything, and people notice that. But the, the timing and willpower power of Jesus has always impressed me, and a lot to, a lot to live up to. <laughs> yeah. and, and Dan, I agree with you. I don't want to spend a lot of time you know, talking about why he's done this at the timing he's done it, but I, I think you're right. I, I think it's the, the idea of, of bringing it in um, as the people can digest what uh, what Jesus is and, and understand what it means in their lives. Anybody else with any thoughts? Uh, some really good thoughts. All right, then let's move on into chapter six. Um, and in chapter six, it brings us to a new section that I've entitled uh, His Power Over the Opposition. Now, we've already seen some opposition. We mentioned back in chapter three how the synagogue officials were looking how they could uh, 
how could they could accuse him of healing a man on the Sabbath day? And at the end of that story, if you remember, it said they went out privately and canceled how to destroy him. Uh, so there's clearly opposition to Jesus already, but we're going to see how this opposition grows, and yet Jesus is going to overcome all of that opposition. And the opposition, as Mark presents it to us, really begins with the one group of people that you would think would be willing to, you know, to tell his story, to, to you know, to be with him. It's his own people. Um, I've always found that kind of interesting when somebody runs for uh, president of the United States and, and then loses their home state. Um, and that's happened on a number of occasions. Even the winning candidate uh, has sometimes lost his own state. And I, you kind of always look at that and you say, what do they know that we don't know? <laughs> well, Jesus lost the city of Nazareth. Uh, in fact, that was one of the very first cities that he lost. Um, and, and so it may not necessarily be the person uh, it may be the circumstances is why that happens. Jesus has gone to his own hometown. Mark presents this story a little differently, a little different timetable than Matthew and Luke do. Matthew and Luke presented at the very beginning of his ministry, um, whereas Mark has it, you know, sometime in. We understand that none of the gospel writers were trying to give us a uh, a step-by-step -step chronological story of the life of Jesus. Um, and so that doesn't bother me. I don't think this is a contradiction in the Bible or contradiction in these um, in these gospel accounts just because they have things in a in a different um, in, in a different time frame in the way that they present the story. Um, Mark is presenting it in the place where it fits in with the theme of what he's talking about. And the theme what he's talking about is uh, the opposition against what he's trying to do. So he's come to his hometown and he is talking to them about the, the, the message of the kingdom. Um, and when he does that, notice the reaction. It says, first of all, they were astonished when they heard his wisdom, when they heard the power of what he's talking about. But then it says they took offense at him. That's fascinating language. How can you be offended at someone who demonstrates power over disease, who is, who is showing the wisdom, the power of God to the point where these people are impressed and they're just, they're just sitting there thinking, wow, I've never seen these things. I've never heard such wisdom. I've never heard such, you know, such explanation of the scriptures. And then to, to be offended by that. And part of the answer, of course, is what Mark tells us, what they were saying in their mind. Well, he's just the carpenter. Uh, Matthew, I think, is the one who records that it said, isn't this the son of the carpenter? But Mark shows that Jesus had, in fact, followed in his father's footsteps, uh, apparently even took over the, the family business when uh, almost certainly at this point, Joseph is dead. Uh, we're not told ever when he died, but he's never mentioned during the ministry of Jesus. And so apparently sometime from the point when Jesus was 12, year old, 12 years old, and he and his family had gone to Jerusalem to the point where he begins his ministry. Joseph has died sometime in that time period. And so Jesus apparently took over the family business. And so he's the carpenter there in, in Nazareth. And his mother and his brothers and his sisters all still live there in town. And Jesus is one of them. And yet Jesus is not one of them. Um, I almost entitled the theme for tonight's lesson, Jesus, Not One of Us, um, because that's very much the attitude that you find here in Nazareth. Uh, you know, we know him, but he's not one of us. And that's the offense that they take at him. In fact, Jesus here makes this statement, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown, among his relatives and his own household. Uh, a more modern take on that is, familiarity breeds contempt. Um, there is very much this attitude, well, we know him so well, he can't be all that. Even though everything he's done has shown, that's exactly what he is. He is all that. Uh, and so it says in verse five, he could do no miracle there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. A lot of the, uh, the fake faith healers that go on TV or do these 
big campaigns, that's their standard excuse. When people challenge them, why don't you heal so-and-so? Why don't you show this sign? Well, you don't believe, that's why I can't do anything. That is not what this passage is talking about. It's not saying Jesus didn't have the power to do those things. Jesus' power was not limited by the, the other people's lack of faith. You know, it, the point was Jesus couldn't do anything productive there. That's, that's the idea. Uh, we're going to see when he tells his disciples here in a minute, sends them out. If the people won't listen to you, move on. But that's, that's what Jesus is doing here. They wouldn't listen to him here in Nazareth. So that's what it means. He can't do anything there because they're not listening. He's going to move on. And in fact, the gospel accounts make it clear that from that point forward, Nazareth is not his hometown anymore. Capernaum is going to be his hometown um, because he could not do anything in Nazareth. They just wouldn't, wouldn't listen. And so then in verse 7 of chapter 6, we find where Jesus calls his apostles together and sends them out in pairs. Uh, we call this the limited commission. Uh, he's going to send them out. This is the first time they're going out on their own, and they're going to be doing the same thing Jesus has been doing. He's kind of taken them on a tour of Galilee and, and other places and has demonstrated the message that he's teaching, the, the power over disease and the power over demons, and now they're trained, and it's time for them to go out and to do what he's been training them to do. And so he tells them, I want you to go out and I want you to proclaim this message. Now he gives them very specific instructions. He tells them that I don't want you to take a change of clothing. I don't want you to take a belt. I don't want you to take a money purse. I don't want you to take bread with you. They're very much, you know, kind of the way you and I would go out to the, maybe to go get the mail. Uh, you know, they're just walking out there completely unprepared, but Jesus is sending them to go one village to the next village to the next village. Don't make any preparation. The idea is don't trust in yourself. That's that's the point behind all of this. Uh, how much money are you going to need to do that? How many changes of clothes do you need? How much food do you need to be able to do any of that? And Jesus is telling them, I don't want you to prepare yourself. Instead, I want you to trust in God to provide what you need. Understand that doesn't mean that we have to follow the specifics when we're going out and teaching the gospel, that we're supposed to go completely unprepared. That's not the point that Jesus is making here. But the point that he is making is, is that we need to recognize that it is God's power that is going to save, that is going to teach, that is going to convert people uh, to the message of the kingdom. It's not us. It's not what we can do. Uh, it's not what uh, special magical uh, uh, class material that we're using. Um, it is simply putting our trust and our confidence um, in the word of God. One other point that I think is very significant here is this, that Jesus sent them out in pairs. Uh, I've had the opportunity to uh, to be out in what we would call the mission fields. So that doesn't necessarily mean you have to leave the borders of the United States. Uh, quite honestly, Caleb Churchill, uh, where he is in in, uh, in New York City, he's in a mission field. Um, I, I had the experience of working in uh, Southeastern Europe and Bulgaria and also working in China. Uh, I can tell you that there is great wisdom in what we find Jesus talking about here and going out in pairs. Um, when we went to Bulgaria the first year we were there, there was another family there working with us, and they were absolutely vital. I, I don't know how we would have gotten through it if they hadn't been there to help us. The last three years, uh, we were there by ourselves, and I got to experience uh, both with and without someone to work with you, uh, and there's a world of difference. Uh, when we were in China, we uh, every time that I made a trip to China, I was there with other preachers. Uh, one time it was uh, one other, uh, another trip there was, I think, two others or three others, and then the other trip there was uh, six of us all together. So different numbers of groups, and again, I see the wisdom, uh, the absolute necessity um, in that. Uh, and so I see the wisdom here in Jesus sending them out in pairs like this. Um, and you see in verses 12 and 13, the message, 
repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was the message of John the Baptist. That was the message of Jesus. And that's the message uh, of these men. And then verse 13, they're casting out demons. They're anointing the sick people with oil and they're healing. them. Then we move into verse 14 of chapter six. Um, got one behind on my slides there. And that's where we find the very interesting story of Herod the Great. I believe this is actually retelling something that had occurred before this time. But when this message of Jesus is being proclaimed, now, instead of having one person going from village to village, we have six pairs of people, plus perhaps Jesus himself, going all together preaching this message. So the effect is being multiplied uh, to the point where Herod is aware of this now. And when Herod hears about this message being proclaimed, he, like other people, is kind of wondering, who is this? Except Herod's not wondering. And Herod is convinced that this is John the Baptist resurrected from the dead. Now, what made him think that it was John the Baptist resurrected from the dead? My answer is a guilty conscience. And I think the way that Mark tells the story, I think, emphasizes that point. It says, it tells us the reason why he would think that is because Herod had been responsible for putting Mark to death. I mean, putting John to death, excuse me. And they tell the story because Herod had married his brother Philip. His, Phil, his brother Philip was married to Herodias. And Herod, by some method, and we're not told specifically what it was, but somehow he had taken Herodias as his own wife. The history books confirm this, that in fact, Philip and Herodias uh, had been separated, and perhaps it was because of her infidelity with Herod, and that she had divorced Philip and had married Herod. And so the two of them had become married. I found it very interesting that as we look at Mark's account, Mark says that she is Philip's wife and says that she is also married to Herod. Now, when you look at Romans chapter 7, Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 3, make it very clear that a woman who is joined to a husband and then joins to another man, that is adultery. Now, in the context, that's not the point that Paul's making there. He's actually using that to say, spiritually, we have to be divorced from the law, dead to the law. I should say not divorced, but dead to the law to be able to be joined to Christ. But here we find where this woman is, in fact, the wife of two different men. She's described in the present tense as the wife of two different men. That's a point for those who try to argue that uh, once you're legally divorced, then you're divorced in God's eyes also. And John was telling Herod, you don't have a right to her. Uh, simply, it's not your right to marry her. And Herod didn't like that. I can see, I, I can certainly see why he does that. Obviously, I... Uh, He's wrong in his feeling, but he wanted her. And so somebody told him you can't have her, and he doesn't like that. So he puts John into prison. But he respects John. He respects the power of John. And so he just keeps him in prison, even though Herodias was angry and wanted him put to death. Herod wasn't going to do that. And then he has this feast, invites a bunch of his nobles, uh, basically showing off. And we're told that there was ample alcohol flowing. And the daughter of Herodias, this would have been Philip and Herodias' daughter, uh, Herod's stepdaughter, if you would, comes and dances before them. And we're told that because of the combination of the alcohol and her dance, that Herod makes a very foolish vow to her. That she, he is so impressed by her dance that he says, I will give you whatever you want up to half of the kingdom. And she goes and asks her mother. Her mother finally finds that opening she's been looking for and says, this is what you asked for, the head of John the Baptist on a silver platter. So she rushes back and tells, notice immediately, went back and told her this is what she wanted. And Herod is very sorry about that, but he'd already made his vows in front of all of his nobles. And so he has to do what he's committed to do. And so we find the death of John the Baptist. Remember, John the Baptist is a man that Jesus described as the greatest of those born of women. And yet here we find the greatest of those born of women 
who was put to death because of a foolish man, alcohol, and a woman dancing. Uh, there should be a lesson for us in there uh, of how the things of this world, um, how they can destroy us spiritually, how they can lead us away. In verse 29, it says, when the disciples of John heard about this, they came and took away his body and laid it in a tomb. How, how difficult that must have been. Um, how, how demoralizing uh, that would be for the disciples of John to, to have to do that. Well, we come back to the present tense now. And the disciples that Jesus had sent out in pairs, they come back and report the glorious message of how the, the kingdom is proclaimed, the demons have been overcome, diseases have been healed. And then Jesus tells them in verse 31, all right, let's take a, let's take a little vacation. Here it shows the importance of um, rest and relaxation. We need that time to decompress. We need that time um, to relax from what must have been very difficult and emotional work they're doing. Again, this is the first time they've been out on their own. They're not professional speakers. They're fishermen. They're tax collectors. They're a variety of different jobs, but you know, none of them were trained other than the training that Jesus gave them prepared to do this. And so it must have been physically and emotionally draining for them. So now Jesus says, let's take a little time to rest. Let's go on a vacation. Uh, but you'll notice they're not able to get a vacation. Uh, it says that when they came in uh, verse 32 and 33, the people saw them going and they ran ahead uh, and met them there. Let's stop at that point and, and open it up for anybody who's got any questions or comments about that section we just finished. Anybody with thoughts or comments? One thought regarding um, Herodias and uh, her daughter. What a what a truly vengeful person. I mean, she could have advanced their household. They could have become rich beyond their imaginings. Half the kingdom was at their, was at their uh, disposal. And instead, she says, I want his head. And she doesn't just want him killed. She wants, him on, she wants his head presented on a platter. Right. So, I mean, just the, the lengths to which she wants to go to kill this man for nothing more than just simply trying to obey God, uh, it really speaks to her character. And it's really shocking when you put it in that light, or at least yeah. to me. I, I think you're right, Matt. And it goes to say that when somebody says something to you that you don't like, in this case, the truth, um, there are some people that just don't get over that. Anybody else with uh, thoughts or comments? You know, it is. I was reading your notes on this that you sent out and then also listening to you talk about this. Kind of the three major points there mm -hmm. as far as what contributed to the death of John the Baptist was that the alcohol, the sensuality, and the um, vengeance. And I, I can't help but think of the, the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, and then the opposites of those fruits, um, among which are uh, sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, hatred, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, uh, skipping down, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and anything similar. I, I think so many of those played into this fact. And what's interesting about that is, is that what Paul writes there to the Galatians is, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, the, the very thing that Herod offered to, uh, <laughs> to Herodias was half the kingdom. <laughs> yeah. So it's just kind of ironic that, that you know, that, that's the description that Paul uses there in Galatians 5. Yeah, absolutely. I, I appreciate that connection. That's a very good one to make. Herod was offering half of his kingdom. Uh, whereas the point you made from Galatians 5 is very important. Uh, Jesus is saying, or Paul, I should say, that you know, they will not inherit God's kingdom. Anybody else with thoughts, comments? All right, we've got, the, we got our thinking caps on tonight, and we're really cooking here. All right, let's move on uh, to what we find here, starting in verse 32 of chapter 6. And this is what I'm calling the, 
the power to feed. Uh, what we find here is that this group of people who saw Jesus and his disciples leaving, they anticipated where they were going, ran ahead, and got there before they did. And so although Jesus and the disciples were taking the straight path across the sea, uh, the people are running around the shore of the sea and get there ahead. But I think this is very important. Um, we, of course, know that there are some, some churches of Christ that use their treasury uh, to feed people, have food banks of some sort, or they're always constantly you know, thinking what they can do to, uh, to feed the hungry. And with the attitude and the intent of mind and thinking, well, this is how we're going to bring them so that they hear the message of the gospel. But if you look at the way this story is set forth, uh, and John's gospel makes this even clearer, but, Matt, but Mark's gospel also makes this point, what we find is that Jesus' first interest is for their spiritual need. You'll notice it says there in verse 34, when they went ashore, he saw a great multitude and he felt compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. These people had come to Jesus because of the healings, because of his power over the demons, because of the wisdom of the message he's been teaching. And that's what they've come for. And so Jesus, it's told, feels compassion for them because they are sheep without a shepherd. They don't have anybody to lead them. And so what's he doing? He's teaching them. And apparently he teaches them all day long. I, we don't know what time they got to the shore, but the way that Mark presents this, it was a, a very long time they've spent together that Jesus has been teaching. Them. And then it says in verse 36, or 35 and 36, the disciples are actually the ones who come to Jesus and said, you know, it's getting late. They're going to be getting hungry. I wonder if really the disciples were also getting hungry. Uh, but they came up and told Jesus, well, you know what? You need to send them out because uh, they need to be able to find food. And, and that's where Jesus said, well, you feed them. And, of course, the disciples don't have enough food for that. They, they had enough food for 13 men. Uh, five loaves and two fish, that, that was really enough to feed just them. And so they, they said to Jesus, well, we don't have enough to feed this many. And Jesus says, what do we have? And so they told him the amount of food they had. And he said, you know, have them all sit down in groups and, and we'll start feeding them. And of course, we're told now that Jesus blessed this food, broke it up, gave it to the disciples to distribute. And we find out that there was, what, 12 baskets full of food that were left over from this. What we need to recognize, though, is the order in which this is shown. Jesus is, first of all, concerned about their spiritual need. And then when people come to him with the spiritual need, and he feeds that, then he also takes care of, as almost a sidelight to this. This was not the primary thing. He wasn't putting up a sign, come for food, and we'll teach you the Bible. The, essentially, it was a sign that says, I'll teach, you, I'll teach you God's will. And then the people that were there, he said, and, and let's go ahead and feed them. Um, and, and then what we find is that Jesus is going to feed our need for faith. Now, this is the second time now that we're going to find this idea of Jesus and the Sea of Galilee and his apostles. Remember, it's already happened once where Jesus was in the boat with them and the storm came up and he calms the sea. This time, the apostles have gone ahead. Jesus has dismissed the crowd, told them, you go on ahead. And then they've gone on ahead, and it says that they're rowing in the middle of the night. Remember, this was late in the day when Jesus fed them. The people all ate. Now he's dismissed them. So it's, it's, past, it's past dark now. It's the middle of the night. And the apostles are, in verse 49, straining at the oars. The wind was blowing against them. It was blowing from west to east, which is the prevailing wind anyway, but it was apparently a very strong wind, and so they're not making much headway. And this is where Jesus was walking on the water to return back, and Jesus really was just going to pass them by, not say anything to him, not, you know, not saying anything, but somehow they were able to see him. 
And when they saw him, they thought it was a ghost. They were frightened. And that's where Jesus said, no, don't be afraid. It's just me. Now, we do not find the story of Peter asking to, you know, compel, you know, come out of the water, walk on the water to you, or then his fear when he saw the waves and the wind. So again, we know there was a storm. That's not found in Mark's gospel. Uh, but it does tell us in verse 51 that when he got into the boat, the wind stopped and they were greatly astonished. It's already happened once before. But now we see it's happened yet again and still they're astonished. And what does Mark tell us there in verse 52? They haven't learned. Uh, they, they haven't learned all the things that have been happening. Specifically, he says the incident of feeding the 5,000 people with just enough food for, uh, for 13 men. But as I pointed out, what we saw in the previous chapter, they've not gained the insight. They've not understood what all of this means. In saying this, I'm not being critical of the apostles. How long does it take us to figure things out? Well, when I get them figured out, I'll tell you how long it took me. Uh, it's always an ongoing process. Uh, there are things that every time I seriously study the Word of God, I come up with something that was there the whole time. I've been looking at it for 50 years of my life, and I still hadn't gotten it until just recently. Um, so I'm not about to be critical of these men. Uh, I don't think that Mark is being critical of them. He's just simply saying he's showing how this is a, relatively speaking, a, a slow progression uh, for us to grasp what this means. Um, that's why we, it's important for us to keep studying. Uh, it scares me when people say, well, I haven't changed anything I believed in 30 years. Uh, that tells me that means you haven't been studying for 30 years. Uh, you think you've grasped it all and you, you've got a long way to go. Uh, and then we come to the last part of chapter six. It says that he crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret. Gennesaret is the place where that man with the legion of demons had been. So we're back to that same, maybe not the exact same location, but basically in the same place. And now what's happened? Remember, these are the people who begged him to leave their environment. But now what do we see? It says the people uh, immediately recognized him. And what do they do? They're bringing the sick people. Now they're ready for Jesus. Before they weren't ready. But now they're ready. Now they're willing to accept him. And so he's going into the villages, the city of the countryside, and just like that woman with the issue of blood, they're just wanting to touch, touch his cloak. Um, it, it's fascinating to see the change. All right. Um, our time is up. I didn't get into chapter seven, but I'll just try and go a little faster next week. We had such great discussions, though. I, I, I wanted to let all of that go. I learned a lot uh, from those discussions. And we'll pick up um, at chapter seven then. Uh, anybody have any questions or comments about what we covered? Uh, before the two dance, uh, I don't understand why it wouldn't. Hey, guys. Hey, Mark. Hey, Mark. Well, thank you again, everybody who um, uh, had comments and and, and uh, questions. Uh, it really did. It really helped me learn. Uh, Dan Galloway or, or Dan Byers, whichever one of you all wants to go first. Okay. Well, I'll go first, and then we'll have some discussion since we've been i guess in quarantine we've all had a desire to have as as normal of a worship as we can possibly have and we tried to re restart a couple of weeks ago with a recorded service and then we made some improvements last week we went to a live service and eddie did a really good job but it it was only eddie and so some people have a couple of things people have asked for is if more people could be involved and uh, some have asked for us to have songs as a part of that realizing we can't hear each other we tried that one time on zoom and that didn't didn't work out very well but if there can't be singing some way in that and so uh, this coming week 
Adam Higginbotham has a lesson on Sunday, and I've talked to him a little bit about that, and he, he would like to be at home with his family and have a lesson rather than bring them out. And it seems that Zoom's going to work fine for him to present his lesson from home. And then I talked to David Brown. He David's on the schedule to do the Lord's Supper Sunday. And David and Kitty, because of their health, they, they want to stay at home. And David is willing to do the Lord's Supper from home on Zoom also. And then Dan Galloway is on schedule for song leading Sunday. And so Dan is, has got some ideas that he wants to share about how we might be able to sing together. Uh, and that that's those are kind of the things that uh, we've been kind of looking at working, um, trying to get more the include more of the normal things that we do in worship uh, in, into our service is what we're looking for. Still coming out to the building. And well, you know, we're still going we're still going to have people in various places, such the drive-in at the parking lot, still be there and be able to hear it by the FM, everybody that comes, and also uh, people at home can hear it on their on the Zoom, or if they're able to stream to uh, Facebook, even they might be able to see it on Facebook. So uh, those are kind of the things that we've been talking about this week, and 